805. We will try to get started. So let's talk about some prayer requests. Uh, uh, you're welcome to message me any there. Um, but uh, we need to pray for this lockdown. And I enjoy preaching to you guys a couple of three times a week via live stream. But if this lockdown would free up, we could get an interim there. So you actually have somebody, you know, on site you could talk to. And and uh, we need to pray that they loosen up all of this. I, I hope it's coming to an end here pretty quickly. I know um, at the just after the inauguration, uh, President Biden uh, said something about a 100-day mask mandate and not to be rude, but they didn't even obey that to the end of the day. And by the second day of his administration, um, Washington, D.C. And, and New York and, and uh, Detroit, I think, the morning bong, um, uh, had already begun to loosen up some of the restrictions um, I know that there's a lot of feelings one way or the other, and, and I don't want to negate the seriousness of COVID. Uh, it is like the flu, and we don't, you know, the vaccine for the flu is much more readily available. Uh, so, uh, you know, thousands of people die each year from the flu. Um, and and for those of us who have lost family members, it it's probably a little different subject than for those of us who haven't. Uh, anyway, let's let's just pray that that some of that will will come to an end, and there would be uh, not only more freedom, but but more safety and freedom, um, and that we could meet together um, in person and and have fewer restrictions in traveling and so forth. Uh, I think it would would help the church. Uh, so let's pray about that. And uh, I understand that the kids there uh, are virtual until the 15th of February, uh, which is a Monday. So let's pray about that. Uh, the virtual learning is, is better than just, you know, having extra snow days or whatever. But uh, it's it's not the same as being in class. So the students are struggling. And in fact, here in the state of Mississippi, they have... Um, I forget the exact terminology, but the, the A to F grading scale doesn't exist for this year. If kids are in school, they're going to pass. The, the state test, which many of us are against the state test for multiple reasons. They only teach a part of history uh, and uh, they kind of limit what the teacher can teach and so forth. Um, the kids still have to take them, but their scores are irrelevant towards their graduation. So... Let's just pray that the Lord would, again, uh, you know, get kids back in school and get things back on the track. And, and let's continue to pray for the church. Let's pray that the church, uh, churches are, uh, you know, no, we're not really commanded in Scripture anywhere to, to pray for revival. Uh, though there are, you know, a couple of times people ask about, ask the Lord about revival but we need to pray that we each as individuals and corporately as Heritage Baptist Church uh, get more of Christ. Perhaps, uh, I know we talked about not forgetting the sun in, in 2021 or making much of the sun in 2021, and this is very important, but perhaps we need to make John 3.30 our individual uh, verse for the year, as in our, our verse for the year as individuals. He must increase, I must increase. If we each get, excuse me, he must increase, I must decrease. If we each get more of Christ and have less of ourselves showing, then uh, we can have the revival that we're talking about. Let's pray that the church individually and corporately would live that 243 life, that 243 life, uh, you know, God's people called by God's name. Well, that is the church. That's Heritage Baptist Church. Uh, humble, pray, seek, and turn. Humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. Then he'll hear from heaven, 
for, forgive our sin and heal our land. So let's try to get thoroughly right with God this year. Let's make that our prayer. Let's continue to pray for Miss Junior. I talked to Brother Parker yesterday and physically she seems to be doing well. Um, but, you know, perhaps there are some uh, other issues that uh, are not like we'd like them. I'll leave it like that. So let's continue to pray for them. And again, I know several people in the church have either family that are ill or family they have lost to COVID. So let's pray for comfort for them and healing for those who might be ill. All right, I haven't seen any more prayer requests come up, so I'm going to try to open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, knowing that that uh, our church is stressed and our country is in uh, uh, political turmoil. Lord, uh, uh, it's almost healthier if we don't watch the news each day, Lord, because it uh, almost distracts us from you, Lord. Help us to remember that you're still on the throne and that you blessed and grew the church during the days of Nero, so you can certainly grow the church no matter who's on uh, in the White House uh, here in these United States, Lord. I pray that you would just uh, strengthen not only our country, uh, but, but more importantly, Lord, uh, our church, so that our church can impact our country, Lord. Uh, we, we know we need to see a revival, and uh, Heritage Baptist Church can have an integral part in that, not only through these online messages, but through our daily walk and our witness, Lord. I pray you would strengthen us, Lord. We do pray for Miss Junior. We pray you continue to have your will in her life, Lord, and uh, just uh, draw Brother and Miss Parker closer to you and closer to one another in these difficult days for them, Lord. I know several in the church either have sick family or uh, have lost family to COVID. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and comfort them. Lord, I pray uh, for those of us who know our family uh, were Christians and are now in heaven. Lord, I pray you'd help us rest in the in the fact uh, gleaned from Scripture, Lord, that we all arrive in heaven on the same day. For there is no night in heaven. So for us, well, we can count the, the days and the weeks and the years uh, since someone has departed, Lord. But for them, it'll be just a little while. And uh, we'll be there in time for supper, Lord. And I just pray that you would uh, strengthen our church, Lord. I pray that you would, uh, from every member to those who aren't members, but who uh, tune in by uh, Facebook or by YouTube and those who tune in, uh, plan to come uh, there locally, Lord, and who are active associates of the church, but have never actually joined, Lord. I'm sure there's some that fit that. Bill, I pray that you would just strengthen them, Lord. Make us more like Christ, Lord. Help us to have more of Christ and less of ourselves that we might be that light and that salt you'd have us to be. Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, for all that you've done for us in salvation and in separating us from the world and to thee, Lord. I pray that you would continue to purify us that we might be the best reflection of Christ uh, in his love to our community and our country. Lord, we love you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We have been talking about the different names of God in Scripture. And of course, last week I preached a sermon that is not original with me. Uh, the list uh, is somewhat uh, my own, but I noticed in going through it, I, I had some, some typos in that. But I want to go back through that. We've gone through all of the Jehovah uh, combinations and and we've gone through, uh, you know, Adonai and El Shaddai and things of that nature. So I want to look at some of the New Testament names this morning. And, and frankly, I'm going to use the ones that start with A, and there are more than I will cover. We'll try to uh, pick up those. Thanks for that. Amen. Uh, we will try to pick up those uh, next week uh, and finish the A's and maybe start with, you know, the next letter. But if you look with me in 1 John 2, 1, uh, I'm going to try you while I'm giving you a moment to turn there. I want to try to explain to you that, uh, you know, many people, many good, good, godly people, people that I believe is as much as I am are born again, um, uh, they um, misunderstand scripture and 
and perhaps are not familiar with the whole body of Scripture, and they, they think that, uh, you know, if you commit a sin, then you lose your salvation. And I try to cover that logically with the fact that, you know, my children don't always obey me, but they don't cease to be my children. I try to cover that logically uh, with uh, the, the teaching from, while well, you're turning and getting there in, in 1 John, the teaching from John chapter 10. And in John chapter 10, uh, middle of the page in my Bible, I'm not sure where it might be in yours, but in John chapter 10, Jesus is saying that he's the door to the sheepfold and I have sheep that you know not of. And, and uh, he says here, in verse 27, which is towards the end of the chapter, but it's around the middle of the second page of the chapter in my Bible. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I've given to them eternal life. Notice it doesn't say eternal life unless they mess up again. It doesn't say eternal life unless, oh no, they missed more than two Sundays. Uh, it doesn't say I've given them eternal life unless they go get drunk, unless they fill in the blank, okay? Now, I think that we will do uh, we will be conscientious not to do uh, things that we know are wrong if we are his, but everybody makes a mistake. We gossip. We eat too much. I mean, come on. Uh, there are lots of ways that we can dishonor God. He says, I give it to them eternal life and they shall never perish unless they mess up. No, it doesn't say that. And they shall never perish and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now I say to to Kate, are you a human? You know, obviously she's not a man, but she's a human. And, and then you can't even pluck yourself out of the hand of God. All right, the next verse says, my father which gave them is greater than I, greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands. I and my father are one. So in order for you to lose your salvation, you'd have to break that promise that no man can pluck you out. Okay, it's impossible. So look at, at, at 1 John. I told you to go to 1, but I still want to go over some here in chapter 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, when we have, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled the word of life. That's capitalized. We've already mentioned that Christ is the word several times. Um, for the life was manifested, we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So Jesus was with the Father, and then he came and was manifested, or we saw him. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, and ye also that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things... Uh, write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now he goes on. Listen, I'm not going to read the whole whole chapter, though it's pretty short. Uh, he goes on down here, uh, verse number five. Oh, I guess I am going to read the whole chapter. Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Oh, oh, so if we commit a sin, we're not in Christ. Hmm. That's what some people teach from that verse right there. But let's look at the whole context, right? The scripture says line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Let's definitely look at all the context, which means the text that's with that text, okay? The next verse, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Notice it didn't say if we say we are his and walk in darkness. It says if we have say we have fellowship with him. So if I sin against God, I do break the fellowship with God. The next verse, verse number seven, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say, in verse eight, if we say that we have no sin, see, here's another thing that burst or breaks that idea that we will that we can't ever if we ever commit any sort of sin or wrongdoing that we lose our salvation and then those people have to be saved again there's another way to to, to bash that thought there but uh it says if we say we have no sin we we deceive ourselves Everybody has sin. I heard a, a good godly woman say one time, it occurred to me this morning 
that I haven't sinned in four days. And I thought, dear lady, you just did because that's a whopper right there, all right? Uh, as in a whopper is what we would call a big lie down south when I was growing up. All right, verse number nine. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. There's three times writing to believers in this chapter. He says, if you say you don't have any sin, you're not, you, the truth is not in you. Well, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So what did Paul say of himself? Paul said, uh, Christ Jesus came to save uh, sinners of who I am chief. So Paul refers to himself multiple times as the chief of sinners. And yet some people expect us to believe if we mess up, we can't ever be saved again. Which gets us to the next little bit here. Let's read 1 John 2, 1 through 3. Okay. My little children, so again, he's writing to believers. He's not writing to, to toddlers. He's not writing to, to preschoolers. He's not writing to, to elementary students. He's writing to the children of God or believers. My little children, these things write I unto you that is sin not. So then we should strive to live a righteous life. And notice it doesn't say but, but and if any man sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we can call Christ our advocate. That's a name. He is our advocate. He's our lawyer. He's Jesus Christ the righteous because in him is no, hello, Matt uh, and Beck. Um, there is no sin in Jesus Christ at all. Uh, an advocate is someone who goes to uh, the judge, in this case, God, on our account. So no, it says three times in chapter one that, that none of us can say we don't have any sin. And when we do sin, chapter two, verse number one, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation means satisfaction. If you think of scales, okay? If you think of scales, boy, here's all my sin down here. And here's my righteousness. Boy, the sin far outweighs the righteousness. My righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. Now, some theologians say that's not menstrual rags. Some theologians say that's rags that you clean up an infectious wound with. Either way, it's not a pleasant thought. This is my uh, uh, righteousness is something, you know, that needs to go in the incinerator at the hospital. The only way I can balance those scales, the only way I can balance those scales is by Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for ours only. Now, some people use this very chapter to say that Christ is only the propitiation for certain people. But it says right here, he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It doesn't say for all the elect. It says for the whole world, it is sufficient for the sins of all mankind and efficient for those of us that call upon him. Now, I don't argue with people over this, but I want you to see why I don't grasp this whole thing we call the tulip or the, 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 I don't even want to say that I don't believe in the sovereignty of God because I do believe in the sovereignty of God. But those people who call themselves Calvinists take it in my estimation and my understanding of scriptures just a little further than the scriptures do, okay? I think that they're doing that in an effort to please God. So I personally don't disrespect them as some might because they're striving to make sure everybody knows that salvation is only of God. We can do nothing to save ourselves, but they've taken it a step too far. Just like those we've already talked about who believe we can lose our salvation are trying to please God with their lives and they're trying to make sure that they do things right, but they take it just a little farther than scripture does. If you look at the whole counsel of God, hereby we know that we've passed from death unto life if we keep the commandments, okay? So we strive, that's verse three of chapter two. We strive to do what's right. But three times in chapter one, he told us we're going to fail. We're not going to do that 100% of the time. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to lose our temper. We're going to fill in the blank. Because think, go back with me to, we won't turn over there, but think back with me to Hebrews chapter two, 12, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 says, let us run with patience 
That's endurance like that of a, of a marathon runner. The race that is set before us looking unto Jesus. Uh, no, it says laying aside every sin and weight. Sin is sin. So believers need to throw that sin aside. And weight, a weight is not necessarily sin, but maybe it keeps you from doing what's right. For instance, there is nothing wrong with watching a football game on TV. But if watching a football game on TV keeps me from doing something I should do or causes me to do something I shouldn't do, then that's a weight. There's nothing, I'm not saying you can't watch football, so don't, I'm just using that as an example. A weight is something, playing video games is, is not necessarily wrong, but if video games keep you from your responsibilities as a Christian or as a husband or as a father, or as a wife or as a child, then that weight has caused you to sin. You see what I'm saying? So there are things that, that maybe wouldn't bother me, but that, but might cause you to, to, uh, do something or fail to do something. Uh, there are things that maybe wouldn't bother you, but if I had them in my life, I might uh, uh, allow them to cause me to fail to do something I should or vice versa. You understand? Lay aside those weights and run with patience. So that's basically what he's saying here. Hey, look, we ought to live right, but take take heart. God already knows you're going to make a mistake. And Jesus is there to defend you, okay? So the advocate, this is one of the names. We also covered here the word. Let's look to Hebrews. Uh, let's look to Hebrews and chapter number three. Hebrews and chapter number three. And we will look at another name. And uh, we may move a little more quickly uh, through the other list that I have this morning. But I really wanted to cover the advocate well. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The apostle. The apostle is a sent one. Uh, the, and if you think about it, uh, God has one begotten son, and he made him a missionary. I think it's important for you and I to witness to people. I think it's important. We're supposed to, you know, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, follow me even as I follow Christ. Uh, or he actually was more in the to be or the passive tense. Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. All right. But the point is Christ was a sent one, is a sent one. He was sent to the world not only to pay for our sin, but to tell us about himself. He's the high priest. What is a priest? What's the difference in a priest and a prophet? I wish I were there and I could hear you answer because I'm sure some of you know, but a priest speaks to man for God. A prophet or preacher speaks to, excuse me, a priest speaks to God for man. God for man, the priest does. The prophet our preacher speaks to man for God. There is, let's talk about this high priest for a second. The apostle, he's the sent one to tell us about himself. Let's talk about the high priest. Uh, this shouldn't be so hard on you, Hallman. Come on, let's get over here. I exhort, therefore, that First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. And to come, notice again, he said, how many men would he have to be saved? All men. So you have to twist that and add words to make it say only certain people can be saved. He'll have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Here's what I'm getting to you on the high priest. For there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle and speak the truth in Christ. Christ is our apostle. He is the sent one to tell us about himself. He is still carrying out that job via the Holy Spirit today, which the Bible tells us is coming to the world to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. 
and he is our high priest. He talks to God on our behalf, all right? Let's look in, in Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one. The root word of Revelation is reveal, reveal. So Jesus Christ. It says in my Bible up there, the revelation of St. John the Divine. What it should say, notice those titles and chapter numbers, those are not inspired of God, okay? Um, it should say the revelation of Jesus Christ, perhaps by John the Divine, all right, and I know I'm kind of, you know, picking problems here, but just to, for you to understand, a lot of people think the word uh, revelation, uh, you know, means apocalypse or or whatever. It does talk about the apocalyptic times, but it reveals to us Jesus Christ, all right? In verse number eight, Jesus, notice it's written in red, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The Alpha is the first. Everything starts and ends with Jesus Christ. There's nobody before him, nobody after him. He inhabits eternity. You say, but, but God was before him. No, Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Jesus is the one who knelt, Jesus is the one who said, let there be light. Jesus is the one who knelt and formed Adam out of the dust, dust of the earth. Jesus is the one who put Adam to sleep and took his rib and made Eve, all right? Jesus, in the beginning was the word, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's before Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. Because it doesn't say, and it doesn't start with creation. Creation is in verse 3, all right? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And if you look in chapter 21, it says, He said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 21, 6. In Revelation 22, 13, Jesus says again, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Everything starts and ends with Christ. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about the Amen, uh, which has been called the greatest sermon ever preached. Uh, he, Jesus Christ himself is called the Amen. In chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith unto he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. That is not right. That, that is not right. Because it doesn't say the Amen there. So I'm going to have to come back to that because I have the wrong the wrong reference, okay? I have the wrong reference written there. Let me look here real quick and see if I can't fix it. Quickly. I'm looking in my nifty concordance in the back of my Bible, but it is not a complete concordance. So I probably will just have to advise you as to where that's found in the next hour, but let me look real quick. It's Revelation 3.14, not 3.1, 3.14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of, of the creation of God. The amen. The amen is it's true. Remember, uh, you could say verily or truly when you say amen. It means let it be or it's gonna be. It means I agree or let it happen. And so Christ calls himself the amen. It is the truth of God, all right? And then in chapter five of Hebrews, he is called the author 
okay? The author, the chapter five of Hebrews. Let's go to chapter five of Hebrews. And then I may, it looks like I may have a little extra time. So I want to cover uh, one other thing. We It won't be another name. Chapter nine, chapter five and verse number nine, the Bible says, being, let's start in verse eight, though he were a son, that's capitalized, it's talking about Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, all them that come unto him and, and, and ask for salvation truly, not just those who want to get out of hell free, but those who truly want him as their Lord. And then I've already quoted to you in trying to explain about the weights here in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, here we see again, the author and finisher of our faith. He, he wrote it, he made it, he finished it. Remember what he said on the cross? Well, he said several things on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I already said that. I thirst. But he also said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. Everything to take you to heaven, to take me to heaven, was finished on the cross of Jesus Christ. He is not only the author of our faith, but he is the finisher of our faith. So let's go back to this idea of losing your salvation. There are two extremes to this um, You can't lose it and your conduct doesn't matter. And there are people out there, I've heard people say, I'm saved by grace. I don't have to obey the laws of man. No, I can't go out and uh, murder somebody. Now, if I did in a fit of anger, murder somebody, I, I don't believe I'm going to lose my salvation, but I shouldn't presume upon the Lord, even Jesus Christ himself, said to Satan, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we shouldn't tempt God. We shouldn't presume upon his goodness. But the other extreme on the on the people who think you can lose it, they either think you, they, they believe in what some might call uh, repeated regeneration, getting saved over and over again. I, I have a a good friend there actually related to me who talks about losing their temper on the way to church and having to get saved in the parking lot before they go in. Now, I, honestly, I think they're saved. I think they just uh, don't have a full understanding of scripture. And so they think they need to be uh, saved again, but I think they're just restoring the fellowship with God. Now you may disagree with me and that's okay. But um, the other extreme is, that you can lose your salvation if you walk away from God. And if you walk away from God, you you, you lost it and you, you can't get it back. And, and they take that here from Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith toward God. So we're not going to talk about that again. We've already talked about repentance from dead works and faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. We've already talked about all of that. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So some people want to say, well, he's just talking about people that were under conviction of God. They, 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 they tasted the heavenly gift. The, the Holy Spirit convicted them that they needed to be saved, but they, they didn't truly get saved. 
uh, or what, what I know as an apostate, someone who looked like a believer, acted like a believer, but walked away and proved they were never a believer. Uh, but if you look at the, at this this wording here, tasting of the, the the good word of God and tasted of the heavenly gift, that's the same word uh, tasted that talks about Jesus tasted death for every man. So did he just taste death? And and in the words of a good friend who believes this, um, did he just roll it around in his mouth and spit it out, or did he actually die for the sins of mankind? Well, we know he actually died for the sins of mankind. So it's not talking about if someone was convicted and walked away, but it is the rhetorical statement, which I think, this is why, again, I don't argue with these people. I let them believe what they want to believe in because they're good, godly people. They just miss, I think they misunderstand this chapter. They think I misunderstand this chapter. But we agree that you have to understand God loves you, uh, that you're a sinner, that Christ paid the price, uh, that sin has a salary and Christ paid the price. And if I call on him, he'll save me. We agree on those things. And so I, I, I can be friends with them. But here, uh, they think someone was saved and they got so far away from God they could not come back to God and they lost their salvation and therefore no chance that they ever go to heaven. I think it's a rhetorical statement. One cannot lose his salvation for if he could lose his salvation, he could not get it back. Okay? Just rest in this. I'm in his hand. He's in the Father's hand. No man can pluck us out. Rest in the fact that when you make a mistake, and we all do, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ. We have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation or satisfaction for our sins and not for ours only. But I also want us to get a hold of the fact that we're supposed to follow after Christ. And he was he is the apostle of our faith. He's the sent one to spread our faith, to pay for our faith. You and I can't pay for our faith, but we certainly need to we certainly are sent out to share our faith with people and make them aware of it. He's the Alpha and Omega. It all starts and ends with him. He is the Amen. He's the truth of God. He is the author and finisher of our salvation. Rest in Christ today. Rest in Christ today. Hello, Kelly. We are going to uh, close out uh, this morning at Sunday school. And Lord willing, I'll come back up at 9 o'clock Central Standard Time, 4 o'clock, whatever standard time it is in Germany. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, uh, again, the ability to meet together even from a distance, I do pray that you would continue to uh, uh, lessen the risks and loosen the liberty uh, associated with this COVID, that the church might meet together in person and that we might get an interim there until I can get there uh, towards the end of the school year, Lord. We put all these things in your hands, Lord. I thank you for all those that tuned in this morning, and I pray that you would strengthen Joe. Uh, I vaguely saw... Uh, something about uh, him not being able to come to the four o'clock, Lord. So I pray you'd strengthen him and his mother, Lord. We love you. And again, we pray for the church and I pray you'd strengthen your church that we would be more like Christ and less like ourselves. In Christ's name, amen.